imagine that. So, could the quantum realm be the key, really, to bringing Star Trek teleporters to life? And what about the new internet? Could we really be paving the way for the future here? Join me as we unravel some of these questions and much more and enter the Codex Legendarium. I'm Shelby Melanson. Just a quick introduction here, if you're new, um, welcome, first of all, to the first ever live episode of the Codex Legendarium. Um, I'm Shelby Melanson, host and the one and only uh, researcher and writer behind the show. So seriously, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you here. So let's get into it today. First of all, I thought as the year kind of wraps up and comes to a close, it'd be nice to go back and talk about some of my personal favorite stories in science and technology throughout the course of the year and maybe give an update on a couple things that we've already talked about in previous episodes. So let's start out with the first thing that has been captivating telescopes and minds around the world for basically this entire year starting in summertime, 3i Atlas. This is the interstellar visitor that people have been questioning and pondering un to an unbelievable degree for months at this point. So why? Let's talk about it. If you haven't seen the episode that I already did uh, on the topic uh, some weeks ago, basically we broke down what's being considered the seven anomalies. In other words, what makes this comet weird? What makes it so much weirder than every other interstellar visitor, although this is technically only the third one? So let me give you an update on what's going on with it. This Friday, December, let's see, December, <laughs> this Friday, December 15th, we are going in to the comets or interstellar visitors closest point to Earth. So what that means is it's going to pass by us at its closest point in its entire trajectory at about 168 million miles away or 168,000 miles away. Uh, 720 million kilometers away or about 1.8 astronomical units and just to be clear that's uh, basically one astronomical unit is the distance from the Sun to the Earth so about twice the distance from Sun to Earth is where 3 Atlas is going to pass us what's really cool about this uh, especially for all of us uh, you know astro <laughs> fans here you can actually see that with an amateur telescope so it's not going to be close enough or bright enough to see with the naked eye, but you will if you have an amateur telescope or even an astrophotography rig with a, you know, a long exposure camera setup, you can actually go out and see this yourself provided you have dark skies. And the best part of this, it's passing by Earth actually coincides with the new moon. So that's going to help with even darker skies for a better chance at being able to see it ourselves. Super cool. I'm excited. Um, okay, so... From there, this whole situation is begin being thought of as a Christmas gift to astronomers, and for good reason, right? We don't, it's not every day we get to observe an entity from outside our solar system this close and personal, right? So let's talk about the main voice in the entire discussion about 3Alice, which is uh, Harvard astrophysicist Avi Loeb. He is the one that's been making headlines about what's going on with this uh, this entity, we'll call it, uh, this object. And I want to give you a little bit of an update about what he's been talking about because even just within the past few days, he's come out with quite a lot to discuss. So let's get into that. Um, on December 15th, I'm going to go uh, most recent to a few days prior with this. December 15th, he basically talked about the anti-tail. So this is something that I broke down extensively in my own video on the subject, um, as per his discussion and others. But the anti-tail of a comet is typically kind of falls into two categories. The overwhelming majority are, it's more or less uh, an optical illusion of sorts. So because of the way light refracts against the particles that are being expelled from the comet's surface, um, it creates an illusion of a tail that is actually pointing towards the sun, so in front of the comet's path, not behind it. So Avi Loeb makes the point that this tail that we're seeing on 3i Atlas, based on x-ray images and other things that we've seen recently and more um, up-to-date captures of this object, this tail is actually more than 300,000 miles long. That is the average, that, that's actually bigger than the average distance between Earth and the moon. So this tail is incredibly long. And he actually makes the point that whether or not this is 
possible, whether or not this actually works in the sense of can gas and dust sustain that length of a distance um, at the speed that this comet, this object is traveling, he says it remains to be studied. So hopefully we'll get more on that as the uh, passage, the closest passage actually happens. Um, okay, so the day before that, on the December 14th, he basically again emphasized the fact that more recent images, um, let's see, yeah, so he emphasized the fact that in more recent images um, on December 14th and uh, December 13th, the green color of the comet, again, uh, we've talked about this in my previous episode, but um, it, the comet actually changed from red to green. And the reason that happened is um, as the comet has moved towards the sun, it's heating up. And we're seeing that in terms of chemical composition changes. So that's really in interesting. Let's see. Um, okay, and... My personal favorite, uh, let's call it a discussion point from Avi Loeb in recent days, he did a kind of interesting Q&A discussion um, in an article online, basically in effort to answer some of the main questions that are being posed and talk about some of the things that are getting brought up in media headlines. And he made a, a really interesting point that I personally think is worthy of a discussion. So let me just read you this quote directly. Um, okay. Quote, the foundation of science is based on the humility to learn, not the arrogance of expertise. When comet experts argue that the interstellar object, 3I Atlas, must be a familiar water-rich comet as soon as it was discovered in July, they behaved like an artificial intelligence system, only able to reflect data sets they were trained on. So why is this interesting? We have... Over the course of 2025, the arguments and uh, concerns and uprising of AI has been something on everyone's mind. So that he making the point that science is kind of, in a sense, perhaps limiting itself on what may be commonly understood versus being able to do what AI cannot do and expand its thinking to new possibilities that have never been seen before. I think that discussion is only going to become more relevant as we go along. He continues with a quote to say, first, science needs to be viewed as a continuous process rather than as a finished product. Collecting evidence is, learning, is a learning experience akin to the work of a detective. It sometimes unravels a sobering truth that was not anticipated since nature is more imaginative than we are. This was certainly the case when quantum mechanics was discovered a century ago and revealed a reality that was counterintuitive, Albert Einstein's findings. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit and talk about why you probably clicked on this video. Star Trek teleporters. <laughs> Let me start by saying it like this. Earlier this year, I actually stumbled across this super cool website called Are We Trek Yet? Not Are We There Yet? Are We Trek Yet? And the whole premise of this site talks about how it's, it's basically an outline, out, you know, picking out the key points of technology that we see across the entire Star Trek franchise and seeing how close we are in real time to actually achieving that. So there's one point that uh, when I came across it, it kind of made me raise my eyebrow, which is teleporters. Because on the website, this, it says that the, uh, the, the category that it's labeled as is not having been started yet. So according to the site, we're nowhere close to it. But I wanted to dig in a little bit more and find out, is that actually true? Because I'm not so sure. All right, let's talk about something. Uh, let's get the basics out of the way. The human body has seven billion, billion, billion atoms in it. Okay, think about that for a second. And then this will become relevant in a moment. Every single one of those atoms also has a number, in many cases multiple, if you look at the uh, periodic table and research atomic numbers, has multiple electrons, okay? So we're talking about the human body being an entity with many, many, many tiny particles in it. And if you look at the actual breakdown of how teleportation would work, it typically falls into two categories, but in essence, it's a point of being able to move all of those individual particles, right? So let's think about how this would work. Because the first stepping stone to creating a human teleporter, which again, we'll get to in a second, is 
being able to create an individual particle teleporter. And this is what science is doing right now. Okay. This year, a team of three institutes, three, so scientists from three institutes actually came together to work on transporting information via connected photons or particles of light. And they did this successfully. Stop and think about this for a second. A team of scientists successfully teleported a particle, right? That's amazing. We simultaneously, let, let me back up a second and explain how this works. So, remember I mentioned a minute ago that quantum teleportation and teleportation in general kind of works in two separate ways? So let me break this down in simple terms. The first way is essentially this. The idea of, collect, of uh, deconstructing, if you will, the parts of a physical matter and then moving those parts, in other words, the particles, atoms, electrons, through space time in a much smaller space because you know uh, our physical structure would be much less would take up much less room in this fashion so you'd be transferring that through some kind of medium like for instance a fiber optic cable like we saw in this experiment and then you'd be reassembled on the other side that's one way brings up a lot of concerns we'll get to that in a second also the second way is basically dependent on something called quantum entanglement. Now, what quantum entanglement is, is um, if you go down into the realm of, uh, let's call it Ant-Man, right? So take this. We're talking about infinitesimally small quantum particles. There is the thinking, essentially, that two quantum particles can be connected with some kind of bridge in the sense that no matter how far apart these two particles are in space and time, they're actually linked and they can actually communicate. I actually did a whole episode on this. This was our pilot episode um, here on the Codex Legendarium. Uh, so check that out, all about something called synchronicity. And there's so much more to be talked about on this particular subject, but for our purposes, go check that out. So for quantum teleportation, what that means is, um, Uh, let's see. Sorry, I lost my place, guys. <laughs> Bear with me. This is our first ever live episode, so thank you. Um, so here's the thing. With this experiment, they successfully proved the fact that you can actually send real-time information between one particle of light to another, and they used a medium of fiber optic cable. And there was actually a previous experiment last year that essentially did the same thing, and this is proving to be an insane stepping stone for this kind of technology. Why is that? Because um, previously there was no way to basically expand the, like the travel time of light through a cable. But we've proved now that it's possible. And essentially what that means is um, the existing cable infrastructure that we already use for the World Wide Web could actually facilitate teleportation. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, so next let's talk about the concerns of this. Obviously, we are a long way off from being able to, in the long term, teleport a human being. A particle is much different than a person. However, back in 2012, something called the Canary Island Experiments actually laid the foundation, if you will, for perhaps what might allow us to do that in the future. And here's how it worked. They discovered that instead of using light photons, particles of light, to transport information in this way, they actually did it with electrons. And like we talked about in the intro here, um, the human body is made up of particles with physical mass, in other words, electrons, among other things. So the fact that they could do it just with a particle of light, which is not something that is considered to have physical mass, to, and then did it with something that did, could very well prove the fact that we are on the path to bridging technological gaps that we never thought possible before. That said, let's get into the concerns. First of all, what is the closest possible thing that we can compare teleportation to right now, right? So going back to the way that quantum mechanics works, when you teleport something through quantum entanglement, it's basically a copy. So you're creating a copy of particle A and wordlessly instantaneously transporting it to particle B. The problem is, when you do this, particle A vanishes. So 
transition that to talking about transporting a human being. Would this effectively mean that stepping into a teleporter would eliminate the copy of your original person and then create a perfect other copy that nonetheless is the same, but is really the same? Are you the same person if you step into a quantum teleporter? For those of us like me who are a little more abstract in some of our thinking in addition to the science, does this mean that the soul would be brought over with the copy or not, right? So something to think about. Um, the concept of the soul actually being separate but ir irreplaceably linked to the body comes from the ancient Greeks and philosophers. Um, let me read you a quick qu quote from Aristotle on this. Quote, the soul neither exists without a body, nor is a body of some sort. For it is not a body, but it belongs to a body, and for this reason is present in a body, and the body of such and such a sort. Aristotle. So let me ask you, would you be up for it? Would you step into a Star Trek teleporter? Do we know whether or not the original being would be the same? I don't know. Um, <laughs> You're going to have to let me know in the comments what you think about this. I'm really curious to know uh, what your take is. Uh, it's kind of along the lines of something we talked about in another previous episode about uh, the Kepler project and habitable planets. You know, would you willingly go to sleep on a ship and uh, wake up in many, many decades from now to, for the hope of exploring a new planet? And also, if we did eventually reach the state where we can use quantum teleportation for human beings, where is the line of where it's okay? Are we okay with it for the purpose of, you know, teleporting into a part of deep space? Or are we okay with it? Is it, is it broad and widespread enough that we would be okay with using it to teleport to work? Is it worth that risk? I don't know. You're gonna have to let me know what you think in the comments. Let's see. Okay, and uh, on that point, I did want to address one audience question before we go here. Um, so this is a question that was left on, again, that Kepler episode. Uh, it, I just, it really sparked my thinking on this because I just think it's fantastic. So this was basically talking about um, mirror life and other issues, right? So the context being that, um, you know, scientists creating something that could, in potential real theory, it poses a massive threat to all life on Earth, right? So the question was, have you connected the mirror life threat to the great filter explanation for the Fermi paradox? Okay, so a super quick breakdown of this. The Fermi paradox is something that is talked about a lot in terms of uh, why we haven't uh, come to terms with or encountered other life in, a main, um, in space exploration. So the Fermi paradox is basically the point that there is a evolutionary, if you will, wall behind uh, which it's basically an insurmountable obstacle uh, that life would have to pass in order to continue to grow and, you know, uh, intellect to be able to increase, right? So the idea that mirror life in theory, so the path of scientific exploration would always get to the point of mirror life and then we would, in essence, eradicate ourselves by way of creating this because, you know, it brings back kind of thinking about Jurassic Park, right? It's like, just because we can do something scientifically, should we? Um, that's a theme that you're gonna see in quite a lot of these episodes. It's something I feel is not discussed enough, but is uh, really critical to uh, discussions on basically all of these matters. So, I don't know, that's, uh, thank you so much for that question, but uh, that's a really, really great point to think about. And uh, I think that's where we're gonna end today's episode. So seriously, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for bearing with me in this new kind of interesting format. Uh, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled episodes soon, but um, have an excellent week. And thank you so much for joining uh, Codex Legendarium. Thank you so much. I'm Shelby Melanson.